I got tweeted a, a recently something that kind of pissed me off. Apparently, uh, Richard Wolf had some of the Chapo guys on, which I take as Tara of this segment that we do on this show now. No, actually, I take it as the fact that we really got to get in touch with Richard Wolf. Uh, but until we get in touch with Richard Wolf, the uh, famed Marxist economist and host of uh, Economic Update with Richard Wolf, David Griscom, our chief economist, will continue his Oedipal drive to dislodge Richard Wolf from his position, from his social standing, and from his podcast. David actually told me that he literally wants the keys to the economic update. David Griscom, economic update. Griscom, economic minute. Go for it. Guns out for Wolf, buddy. Guns out, yeah. Um, yeah, so this week, I actually wanted to talk a little bit about an interesting report that I was reading in the Washington Post by uh, great reporter Jeff Stein. Uh, recently, we have seen rents fall, but for the rich. <laughs> and in fact, they have been rising um, from the poor. So to quote directly, from his piece in Washington Post, uh, since last summer, rents have fallen for the highest earners while increasing for the poorest in San Francisco, Atlanta, Nashville, Chicago, Philadelphia, Denver, Pittsburgh, Washington, and Portland, Oregon, among other cities. In several other metro areas, including Los Angeles, Las Vegas, Houston, and Miami, rents have risen for the poor and the rich alike. So I guess a little redistribution there. Um, so. It doesn't take a lot of political education to understand that housing prices and the housing market itself is in complete crisis. Uh, for years, city governments across the country have promised this kind of weird neoliberal compromise where they're going to increase uh, high rise, high rent buildings, luxury buildings, basically, and that those will have effects of trickling down throughout the economy because it will make more typical apartments uh, cheaper. Well, obviously that hasn't been the case, and in this, as this report says, you know, I, I know for a fact uh, about the situation in Washington D.C., where you have seen a lot of these luxury buildings going on, really weird uh, contracts between the city government and these luxury developers, um, and you know, all these buildings have shot up while rent prices has have continued to skyrocket. And I mean, just to like understand the context numerically, uh, 20 million Americans uh, renters are classified as cost burdened, which means 30 percent of their income is going toward rent. Um, Many of it, many of them, even more. Oh, certainly, yeah. without, and I'm going to get right. to that in one second. I mean, <clears throat> according to a Harvard study that we, I was looking at from 2017, um, almost half of renters, 47.5 percent, have a cost burden of over 30 percent of their income on rent. The majority of this group, 25.2 percent of all renters, are under what's called severe rent burden, meaning that they're paying over 50 percent of their monthly income on rent. Now. It doesn't take a lot to understand how this is a huge problem. And just to, for more context, this is obviously a racial issue too. A black households have a higher bo have the highest board burden at a 54.7% of renters have a cost burden. Um, and Hispanic households are at 53.7%, so just right behind there. So how do we get there? And, you know, we'd like to take a little bit more structural Marxist view of this problem. A lot of people try to look at it as like a, su a supply problem where there's not enough housing and that's why rent prices are up. That's not the case at all. The reason that we have this problem is because of the way that we treat housing. It's a tension between use value and exchange value. So just to explain those Marxist concepts to you, a use value is what you when you use something. So if you live in a house, right, that's a use value. If you use it to protect your family from the for shelter, that's a use value. If you use it to store things, that's a use value. An exchange value is how you exchange it on the market, right? And that's the price that you get for it. Now, we've seen over the past 20, 30 years, there has been a huge explosion in speculation in the real estate market. Now, you don't have to be an economic historian to remember that that was a big part of uh, 2008. And we've seen since deregulation in the 80s that the financial, financial products that are actually tied to the housing markets have exploded. So we have all these kind of derivatives and, and swaps and equity firms that own majority of uh, the housing um, and new apartments that are going up, especially in places like New York City. Uh, an incredible amount of house, uh, new apartments in New York City are owned by these equity firms, which caused a lot of problems in 2008, 2009 when these apartment buildings were becoming foreclosed on. Because the question is, you know, who do you call if it's just some kind of strange, uh, you know, dark equity firm that owns these housing? So we need to really start talking about seriously 
this is a structural deficiency in our system. And like we could talk about kind of things that we can alleviate the tension when it comes to housing. And those can be things like um, uh, rent control. Those can be things like building co-op housing. Those can be things like social housing. But as long as the financial markets are basically able to profit off of wild speculation on housing, we're going to see those values continue to jump because all social housing, all housing, in our system today is all being speculated on the potential price that it could be sold for in the future and the fact that people are living in there temporarily people are renting it doesn't really matter to the financial system so that's always going to push the prices of rental housing up and until we start to really address that problem kind of weird solutions like these neoliberal solutions building luxury housing with mixed income housing units are going to fail especially when by the way just to point out when a lot of these mixed housing units have ridiculous um, concepts of what an affordable apartment right. is. I mean, you should see, especially like, I know in Crown Heights, this was a big problem when they were trying to build in the Bedford Armory. They were talking something around, you know, affordable housing was affordable housing for like $120,000 yep. household income. And if you know Crown Heights at all, that was an absolutely ridiculous That's concept insane. for affordable right. housing. Right. So we're going to continue to see, unfortunately, these kind of issues. And so we start to really talk about this fundamental contradiction of the market. Um, which is that housing prices are determined by their exchange value and not their use value and their social good. Um, and obviously, you know, this is something that we definitely need to be talking about more as socialists. And we need to also, uh, Kentucky Fried Comrade, uh, last week uh, drew our attention to the post game. I don't have it, the information in front of me, unfortunately, but the ballot initiative in California to allow for uh, rent control again, that's vital on a legislative front. This is another area, frankly, that people I think are going to need to look at, uh, look at in terms of uh, going back to the opening of the show. Renter strikes, uh, you know, using that capital power, um, you know, obviously in some cases to deal with particularly pernicious and oppressive and brutal landlords, but also just more generally restructuring the game on behalf of those who are renters. Um, and in fact, indeed, in some cases, buyers um, then speculators and exploiters on another end this just in use and exchange value wow look at the brains on david you a smart motherfucker david where you learned that shit toodaloo dick wolf <laughs> uh apparently richard wolf now paraphrasing Samuel Jackson lines from Pulp Fiction. <laughs> this is getting very scary. You know, it was my mother uh, called me the other day, and you know, she she watches the show every once in a while. Yeah. And she had just caught it for the first time once in a like, while. Excuse me. She was like, she was like, who is this Dick Wolf? <laughs> what, Dick? what did you do to this? Why is this man so angry at you? <laughs> I don't know, Mom, but he's really, I'm really Ugh. scared. <laughs> Say what again? <laughs> <laughs> Do they have use value in what? <laughs> I don't know. Matt went really brutal last week with the David Harvey stuff. That I think that escalated it to a whole different level, frankly. David Harvey's the metal. He's the... Uh, um Oh, wait, uh, he, David Harvey's the metal? David Har Harvey's the Dimmu Borgir of uh, <laughs> Marxist economists. <laughs> I don't know how many people are going to get that. <laughs> I'm shocked Probably that I Probably a very get small that. number. That's fine. <laughs> who, would win? Really? who would win David Harvey or Richard Wolf street fight? Hmm. Hmm. Harvey. Hmm. I mean, I, I don't know, man. Dick, I, Wolf, Dick Wolf is from, he's from New York. I don't know, man. That's going to be pretty. That's a brutal fight right there. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, this is what I am going to have to actually exercise a little bit of editorial discretion and say it would be a draw. Yeah, <laughs> shut the fuck up, guys. Um, it would be brutal. No, they're, they're, they're like the perfect yin and yang of like... It's sort of like... It, uh, it, if you thought for a minute that... Basically, like there were three figures who had any type of even remote access to kind of pop culture, right? Because and who who articulated a Marxist perspective, right? Like Zizek, David Harvey, Richard Wolff, and it's sort of like 
I don't know. It's like mom, dad, and Joker or something. <laughs> I don't know. Some type of interesting. I'm more worried that uh, David Harvey would just join sides with Richard Wolf and attack me. Uh, mm. They're pretty good buddies, actually. They go on each other's show a lot. And uh, uh, yeah, I heard I heard this little uh, this little <laughs> prick David Grishko was talking shit about you. Maybe we should. I think there should roll be up a, to Brooklyn and I throw him in a river. I think there should be a comic book of David Griscom going on a journey to take on both of these guys. I think there should be a comic book, and then they they teach him like the secret alchemical arts, <laughs> and then we all like join forces and go like I don't know, expropriate Goldman Sachs together or something. That would be a good comic book series. Well, actually, but that's it what we should do. We should have a gang that hangs up out around Wall Street, the three of us, right? And we just sort of hang around like the stock exchange when people leave and like intimidate people. <laughs> <laughs> like that's better than us fighting each other. <laughs> it's like <laughs> so it's like that scene in the superhero movie where you're, where it's like Wolf's like, "Who brought the little prick?" And Harvey's like, "I thought he was with you." And you're just like, "Guys, I want to fight Goldman. <laughs> let me out. Let, let, let me do it." <laughs> Do you really have the discipline? What it takes? <laughs> I have to You're get not like a graduate yeah. degree at Cooney. Yeah. It's like it's a montage. Do you read Capital <laughs> properly or are you going to be whining and watching you porn in a day after? <laughs> it's a serious work, you little fuckhead. <laughs> this isn't talking shit on some podcast. I mean, it is, but it's a lot more than that. 